So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce my, my friend and excellent mentor, uh, Anya Horvat, uh, who's the manager of science shows at Gateway, and who a number of you probably know if you've been to certain teacher programs, uh, because she was involved with those for a number of years. So Anya, it's great to have you here. Thank you again for joining us. Well, it's great to be here. I'm really happy that I could join. I'm so sorry for being late, uh, but my internet decided not to work. Um, and I didn't want to do this over mobile internet. Although, Michael, I know that you are very friendly with um, doing stuff like this on mobile internet as well. Yeah, I've, I've done hundreds of different Zoom <laughs> sessions uh, on a mobile internet. And actually, as a warning, if anyone sees me with a terrible connection in the next couple of weeks, I'll actually be in Ghana doing everything from a mobile hotspot, uh, often from a 3G connection. But I've got a lot of tricks, putting my phone up trees, things like that. So I should have a decent connection for the whole time. But just a, a warning, if my connection is a little bit spotty, there's a good reason behind it. That sounds, um, yeah, fun. And just to let you know, Michael, that experiment should definitely not get cut out. Uh, I absolutely love it. Um, so, so it's just how I wrote you... about it. Well, we'll sort that out <laughs> later, though. <laughs> but I can start sharing my screen, right? Hopefully. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, that's good. So, um, hello, everyone, once again. My name is Anya. Uh, I work at CERN and I've been at CERN since 2018. And I'm really, really happy that I get to do this um, today with you. So to give you an introduction to particle physics and specifically to CERN. Um, now, whenever I want, I, I'm doing a presentation like this, I want to start with something super simple, which is of course telling you who I am. So my name is uh, Anya, as you know, I'm a physicist, did my bachelor's in physics, um, and then I turned into physics teacher teaching, then I turned into a physics education researcher, and finally I turned into a science communicator or a science show developer. I have a fantastic story to come with that um, progression. So I went into physics after having read some particle physics books. Um, thinking that I will be the next person, well, one of the next people to get a Nobel Prize. Um, after a few years studying physics, realized that's probably not gonna happen even if I'm the best physicist, uh, because it's quite difficult and it requires a bit of luck as well. Uh, so then I went into teaching because, you know, if I teach people, then maybe one of my students would become the ne next Nobel Prize winner and they would thank me in their speech. So, you know, it would be already slightly better. Um, realized I only get a couple of students, well, 100, 200 students per year. Um, that's not good enough. Let's go one level further. Let's start teaching teachers. So I was, uh, I spent three and a half years working with teacher programs at CERN. That's where I, I also met Michael. I think it was in 2019 or 18. 2018, the best cohort for international to uh, ah, exactly okay. There's gonna be some people uh, on this uh, meeting who who disagree with that, but they, let's go with that. Yeah, for me, all of them are the best. So you know, <laughs> um, so yes, I was a teacher, teacher. You know, reaching more teachers to reach more students to increase the chances of me being indirectly connected to a Nobel Prize. Um, well, and then I gave up on having a Nobel Prize. So this is where I am now. I'm doing science shows and I'm taking these fantastic photos uh, that you can see on this slide. Uh, this is actually a promo photo for one of the shows that we were doing. And I just wanted to add it because I was a particle detector here um, or actually a particle detective. I literally had a badge around my neck saying, I'm Charlotte Holmes. Um, when I went to visit CMS. Um, so yes, otherwise, something about me. I am super enthusiastic about ball games and I have a lovely, lovely dog who is asleep just behind me. Um, and there's so many different things that I could talk about as well. But actually today, I'm not here to talk about 
who I am. But maybe let's wonder together about what am I? So what am I made of? Where do I come from? And by this, I don't mean Slovenia. Uh, and what will happen to me in the future? Far, far, far ahead um, in the future. And I don't know, I only see Michael there and he's not impressed. I will, I will spend uh, 45 minutes speaking about myself. I, I'm impressed by that. For for me, that sounds fantastic. But I, I mean, some of the others might like other details as well. But I, I would love that. Exactly, and I see some other people on cameras not being too impressed. So I would maybe focus on rephrasing that question a bit and go with, "What are we?" So we as the universe. So what is the universe made of? Where does the universe come from? And, well, what will happen to the universe in the future? These are the questions that are also the leading questions when it comes to particle physics research. These are the questions that we are nowadays trying to answer. And we're getting closer and closer to the answers, but just like everything in science, the closer you come to the answer, the further away it seems. Um, so... I will today go through a bit of um, what we're doing in order to help you see just how far we have come with our uh, research. Can you see my slides still? Yeah, this ah, is still the yes, slide, what are we? And now it's transitioning over to a sphere or circle. To a sphere or circle in which now we're gonna get the most important or the most famous word of today, of course, that is CERN. So CERN stands for, please do not judge me on my French, Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire. So it is a Council of Europe for Nuclear Research. The name there stays, even though um, that is already a bit old fashioned because we're not only looking into nuclear research anymore, at least not in the way that we're used to um, when we talk about nuclear research. Uh, we're actually looking into sub-nuclear research, uh, but still CERN does remain the biggest particle physics laboratory in the world. And with it also one of the biggest institutions in the world. It is absolutely fantastic um, how big CERN is and how much it connects people from all around the world. When we're talking about CERN, of course, the first things that come to mind might be something like that. See, I'm jumping over my own slides and not finding my mouse. So maybe you would think about something like this when you think of CERN. So what we have here on the image, this is the Large Hadron Collider, so the biggest machine um, on Earth. But in fact, that is just one piece of what CERN actually is. CERN is not about the materials that we have and the uh, machines that we are using. The core of CERN are its people and the collaboration that we have with people from all around the world. Every year, uh, we would have, or at all times, we would have over 16,000 people working in somehow of a connection to CERN. Either they are directly employed at CERN or they work here as representatives of their um, institutions like different universities. They are all working together in order for us to be able to discover those fundamental questions um, that I mentioned before. So what is the universe made of? Where does the universe come from? And what will happen to the universe in the future? But before we continue into those questions, um, I will just shortly go through the history of CERN, just because we're also coming close to one really important year. So the history of CERN, CERN was actually thought of just after the Second World War. So after the Second World War, 
um, we could see that the majority of brains, so scientists, really escaped to the US. All the research was happening in the US and we have absolutely nothing against US uh, when it comes to that. But the problem is, well, Europe also wanted to have its own research center. So in 1949, first steps towards civilian research in nuclear um, technology at, uh, in Europe were made. Later on, of course, before we actually get to the final result, we do need some time. So the first meeting of what would then become the CERN Council only happened three years after, so in 1952. In 1953, so 70 years ago, um, as of this year, there was uh, this convention that was complete. So in this convention, among others, it was specified that CERN, the research laboratory that we would have here and the research that we do here would not be in any way associated with military research. So it started what we call science for peace. So science for peace is still something that we are very, very um, about at CERN. So all of our all of our research is still staying away from any military research. But this was just the convention. We're not yet done. The most important thing, the most important year, is here in 1954. In 1954, they started building the first building of CERN, and CERN, as we know it, was born by the signatures of this um, a wonderful piece of paper. Um, so that was in 1953. Uh, 1954. Uh, so in 1954, what uh, what that means, next year, we're going to have 70 years of CERN, and there's going to be plenty of events happening, both at CERN and in other countries. Uh, so I highly recommend trying to connect to some of them, because some of them, of course, are also going to be online. Okay, but that was just the buildings, that was just the people starting to come to CERN, and that was people starting to work on what they will actually do. So only three years after CERN was established, we got to see CERN's first accelerator. That accelerator is called a synchrocyclotron, a ridiculously difficult word to pronounce, um, and it worked until 1991. Two years after the first accelerator, the second one was um, born as well. So it was um, built and started working. Um, and that accelerator called the proton synchrotron is still working today. We're gonna come back to that in just a moment. Um, but now let's start focusing on some of those questions. So we're all, already talking about particle physics, but I've never even mentioned what particle physics is or what particles are. So particles, as a noun that I will be using throughout this, um, hopefully later on the conversation, um, particles we will call the building blocks of our universe. So the smaller, smaller, smallest things that are building our universe. And um, I really, really, really hope this animation will work for you as well. Otherwise, I will share the link um, in the chat afterwards. So here we have a small link, a uh, small video showing just how far inside um, the matter we're going at CERN. So we're now zooming into one piece of hair. You can kind of see here on the bottom at which order of magnitude we are. So we're at really, really tiny um, objects already. So this is 10 micrometers. We're talking about cells. Here we have fibers. Yeah, sorry, I put that thing wrong. So we have microfibrils. Still, even though we already zoomed in quite a lot to 10 nanometers, this is still not 
the building blocks. This is not what we're trying to research at CERN. We're going even deeper. Now we're finally starting to see some molecules. Going into seeing some atoms, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. And now going into an atom. Here I just need to notify you, of course, an atom doesn't have a shell. Not in the way that it's uh, drawn here. It doesn't. It's not a big ball. We what we have is a nucleus, and we're really trying to travel into the nucleus now. This animation is trying to show us just how much of nothing there is um, in an atom. Um, so around this nucleus before was of course the electron cloud. In the nucleus we have protons and neutrons, and now only do we finally reach those elementary particles called quarks. Again, proton as well is not, or as far as we know, is not a ball. Um, it is actually just those three quarks with a bunch of gluons stuck together. And this is what makes us. So if we look only at our human body, or basically, if we look at the earth and everything on this earth, we can describe everything that is made of, uh, that um, the world around us is made of, by using electrons, which are elementary particles, up quarks, and down quarks. So it becomes really easy, well, it starts to seem really easy uh, to explain what the world around us actually is. I now see that I have something in the chat. Oh, yeah, someone was just asking if uh, you could share the link as well. So I looked it up and I just shared it. Uh, ah, so fantastic. That, that's, that's a great idea because, of course, teachers are eager to be able to use it in their own classes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and just at this point, I already want to mention, I will share uh, a link for many other resources here after the talk so that you can really find your way around what CERN has to offer, because CERN not only is looking into these uh, particles of matter, we're also, you know, looking into how students could learn that. So we have several resources already developed. Okay, I will now try to close the chat. Yes, okay. So I'm now saying that we have, of course, up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, but that well, that we kind of know. So why are we still researching stuff? Why are we still asking ourselves, what are we made of? The equation on the right that we have on this cup for coffee or for tea um, is called the Lagrangian equation. This one describes all of these particles and a lot more. And it turns out that, well, we actually know what we are made of. Kind of, not, not really. The problem is that the things that we know are actually just 5% of what the universe is made of. So we know the 5%. And even for that, it took us several thousand years to get to that point. But there is still 95% that we have very little idea about. So it's still important for us to do research, to get to those additional percentages as well, in order for us to be able to understand the answers to the questions of what are we made of, where are we going, and where did we come from a bit better. So how are we trying to figure that out? Well, we are using a very, very, very basic principle. Um, already the cave people were using that one. So the cave people already knew if you want to look into something, you have to smash it. And that's what CERN is doing as well. So we are trying to smash particles together. Of course, we're not doing that um, as this uh, lovely gentleman on the illustration is doing with a stick. Uh, we are doing this by using the CERN accelerator complex. 
This looks like a lot. This probably looks even more complicated than the equation that I showed just a while ago. Um, but actually, this lovely illustration here, or schematics, is showing us how we get from something that we know, meaning how we get from a hydrogen, to something that might be an answer to an unknown. So we start with a bottle of, uh, of hydrogen. I hope you all know um, hydrogen is a very simple gas. It has, an atom of hydrogen has basically one proton and one electron. As such, it's the most simple atom that we can find. And that's why we start with that over here. Um, we have a bottle of that, not too big. Like it, it's a regular bottle of hydrogen. Um, and from that bottle, we are getting hydrogen molecules. Those molecules, first of all, well, we need to, I would say, undress them. So we need to take the electrons away. How do we take the electrons away? Well, by using something uh, that is actually relatively simple. What we need to do is we need to put high voltage around this gas and make sure that we have, I will simplify it slightly, and that we have on one side a plus and on the other side a minus. If you have a plus and a minus, you might already know, you probably already know, that opposites attract and equals they would repel. So what happens if we have high voltage with that high difference is that electrons would be, um, electrons that are negative would be attracted by the positive side. So they would go towards the positive side, but the protons, they are not so excited about going to that um, side. They would rather go to the negative side. However, that is where we, I would uh, put it in quotation marks, trick them and we send them further. So we send protons further and here by this stage here, we can really see that we are now having protons. So we start at Linux 4, we start accelerating, uh, putting it under voltage and here we get into protons. And here, the protons do their first circles. So the first part of the acceleration um, is gonna be linear. It's going in a straight line because that's the easiest one. And then we're already going into a circle. Circles are fantastic for accelerating particles because, well, you just accelerate at one point and particles always come back to that point. You don't have to accelerate for infinite length. So, they are really, really good for acceleration. So we first start with something small called a booster. This one is really tiny. It is only 157 meters long. I know, I know that sounds already a lot, but it's not um, already if you look at the others. So this booster was built in 1972. So already this is a relatively old accelerator. Still, this booster doesn't boost our protons enough. From the booster, we get protons going to the so-called proton synchrotron. Proton synchrotron, as you can see on this image, was built in 1959. So this is the second particle accelerator that was built at CERN. So it is extremely old, still an important part in getting our particles to over 99.9999% of speed of light. So Proton synchrotron doesn't yet reach that um, energy, but it is already a bit bigger. So it's 628 meters long. And the next thing that happens, so the next place where the protons go is actually a proof of particle physicists not having too much, um, how to say, creativity. So proton synchrotron is, 628 meters long. Later on, they were like, okay, let's make a big, bigger circle. 
which would at that point, of course, become the biggest particle accelerator in the world. Um, that was seven kilometers long. And well, it does the same thing as the proton synchrotron, just better. So of course, that's why they named it a super proton synchrotron. As I said, creativity, fantastic. From the super proton synchrotron, particles nowadays also move to an even bigger circle that I already mentioned before. And this is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Large Hadron Collider started in 2010, and it is a 27 kilometer long circle of magnets and um, accelerating parts and detectors that is what actually made the discovery of the most, well, nowadays the most famous particle uh, called Higgs boson actually possible. So we have to have uh, thank the LHC for that discovery to some extent, mostly just the scientists using it. Okay, another thing that you might notice here is that, yes, we have this LHC. And on this LHC, what we have is four yellow dots. These four yellow dots are the four particle detectors that we have at the LHC. All of these are enormous devices designed to detect the smallest of particles. So all of these, everything that concerns the LHC is basically state-of-the-art technology that helps us figuring out the basic questions of human nature. However, these four detectors that you will talk about more once you get to the detector part of this um, course, these four detectors are not the only thing that is important at CERN. Actually, if you look at all the smaller circles here, each and every one of them has another line going out, at least one. That means that they are actually sources of high energy protons or low energy protons sometimes uh, for other experiments as well. For example, my absolute favorite one would be this one here. So this tiny circle that is kind of detached from the LHC accelerating um, chain, it only follows from the proton synchrotron. This part here is called AD, or, well, the hole where the AD is, including the experiments that are there, is something that we sometimes call antimatter factory. We will talk about antimatter in just a bit, uh, but first, let's see what using these accelerators actually helped us find. It helped us and find just, this circle. The antimatter factory is your favorite because that's one of the only ones you've taken me to to visit, right? Exactly. Yes, that's <laughs> that's the that's the best reason why I love it. <laughs> I mean, and it is the favorite of non-LHC experiments. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you asked, like, which one do you want me to take you to? And I was like, can we do that one? I, I don't know. We both love it. Yeah, Antimatter Factory is just, it's, it's a fantastic place. Well, but so is Atlas, and so is CMS, and so... <laughs> It certainly is a fantastic so, so place. I think that's a good like, thing. I, in, in January, February, I'm going to try and do, like, a deep dive into isotopes and isolate, because it... That, that's yeah. like my second favorite. Isolde is just, um, it is, I think many people don't really think about it. It's just so surprising how interesting the facility is and how interesting the research is. It's just such a surprising thing. Um, and also one of the oldest experiments that we have at CERN because it was already, like the, the start of that already started at the synchrocyclotron. So the first experiment that we had, uh, the first detector or accelerator that we had at CERN. So it's a really, really cool um, experiment. And now we're talking about stuff that people have never seen. So maybe uh, we should continue. Well, well, you're introducing all the topics, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop interrupting. But also to mention to anyone else, if you want to interrupt Anya, 
add any questions to the chat. I'll decide whether it's worth interrupting her in the middle of something or leaving it to the end. But I like, also have the chat open next to my presenter view. So I see all of the people that are leaving or joining as guests. So well, hopefully there's more people staying. But yeah, uh, sorry for the interruption. <laughs> uh... Yeah. As, as uh, Michael said, if you at any point want to interrupt me with any question. Yes, I like to speak a lot, so maybe you can't interrupt me directly, uh, but if you put a question in the chat, I will see it. Okay, so accelerators such as the ones that we have at CERN, and of course, also the ones that we do have at CERN, helped us figure out this big circle here. So this big circle that we see on the slide, this is basically what we call the particle zoo, or of course the standard model of particle physics. Here we have all the particles that we now know um, and all the particles that we have discovered and all the particles that make up what we call matter. So here on the outside, we would have the building blocks. Here, so these are the fundamental particles. In the blue, we have force carriers or um, exchange particles. And here at the very center in black, we have the famous Higgs boson. Higgs boson for a long time was a missing piece. Over 40 years, it took us to actually be able to confirm that this would be the missing piece of the puzzle. Um, However, all the rest of these are still interesting because they can provide us additional information about what I already asked before, other parts of the universe that we don't yet know. Um, this is a fun way of seeing this, um, these uh, particles and standard model. But of course, the more classical way is what I already showed before, and that is with this Lagrangian function. You can see that I have reused this picture several times already. So it's a bit pixelated, I'm sorry. Um, but here I have a simple explanation of how, uh, of what this Lagrangian function or what the standard model actually describes. So if you ever want to look really cool in front of your students, I think explaining something like this definitely makes you um, top of the coolness, oh, geek coolness list. So what we have here is, as I said, standard model. And here we have an equation with four distinct lines. This is a simplified equation, but still it takes everything into account. Um, so the first line describes the forces or the interactions. The second line describes how forces act on matter. So what would be the interaction of, so what would be the interplay between particles and um, actual forces, how forces affect those particles. Um, the third one is how particles get mass. And the fourth one is how the Higgs boson works. So all together, they describe everything we know about the universe or everything we know about how universe is built, which is, as I mentioned before, the 5% of the universe. So yeah. Yes, um, I'm seeing also the comment in the, uh, in the chat. Yes, just stating what the terms in the standard model or range and mean uh, is only helpful to some degree. However, if we would really want to understand the Lagrangian equation, yeah, we would need a lot more mathematics and a lot more physics to have um, as what we have in high schools. So it is a really, I could have a long, long lecture on Lagrangian per se, but what we can show with this simple, well, simplified version of an equation and what we can show with the simplified explanation of the equation is that this is what physics is trying to do 
This is what particle physicists are trying to do. They're trying to describe the universe in as simple terms and as simple equation as possible. So everything that we know about the building blocks of the universe can be described by this simple formula. And while it does not increase our understanding by much, by just knowing that this is a formula and that this formula exists, it can, of course, um, help us understand what is behind the motivation of why are we doing this? And at least to me, a bit about the beauty of physics. If you want to know more how Lagrangian um, equation or how the standard model can be implemented in your classrooms, I will, among the links that I will send after uh, my talk, I will also send the link to the paper that really connects this to a bit to what we would know in high schools so that we can get that connection. And Michael, maybe you're faster at um, getting that link for me as well. Uh, so the, let's have a coffee with the standard model of particle physics. Uh, yes, Jeff and Julia's paper, right? Exactly. Perfect. The famous yeah, I'll, Jeff I'll, and Julia paper. I'll get a link for that into the chat. <laughs> okay. So these things up until now help us um, show how universe is made. But how universe was created is also one of the important questions that we have. Of course, I am pretty sure, um, also based on my research that I did for my PhD, um, I'm pretty sure that most of you know or even teach how the universe began. The universe began with the Big Bang. That is according to everything we know at the moment. Uh, and that is the accepted theory at the moment. Um, here I have just the rough schematics of the Big Bang. Uh, I will not go through everything here, um, but what I want to ex explain what's happening on this image is we know a lot about this part here. So from what we what we can see onwards but there's a lot in our universe that we can't directly see and especially there's a lot of things that are too far in the past for us to be able to see what we can see though is first of all the afterglow pattern so the um, cosmic uh, microwave background that is something that is telling us a bit more about the Big Bang. Still, what is over here? What is over here on this back? Well, what we're trying to uh, see at CERN is really what happened before, what happened in the first fractions of the second after the, the Big Bang. This question is trying to be answered uh, by one of the experiments at the LHC. That would be an experiment called ALICE. They are looking into so-called quark-gluon plasma. Um, and what they're trying to see is really how the universe behaved just then. But that's not the only experiment that's looking at the beginning of the universe. The other one that I already mentioned as well um, focuses on an even, at least to me, more interesting question, uh, which is, the disappearance of antimatter. So for the disappearance of the antimatter and for antimatter itself, I need to first go back to this circle. So what we have here um, is of course, all the particles. And the particles that we see here, the majority of them uh, have their own antiparticles. So for example, over here, we have an electron. Electron is a particle that we all know and love. Um, so electrons are negatively charged particles. They have antiparticles called positrons or anti-electrons. Anti-electrons would have the same properties 
as electrons, apart from one very important one, charge. So charge is something that is opposite between the matter and antimatter particle. Small difference, but very important. Why is this difference important? Well, because of that uh, difference, I don't know where I was going with that sentence. So <laughs> um, that difference is important for us to know because it's the only one that we actually see. There's no other differences that we see. So they really are the same. And what happens when an electron would meet an anti-electron uh, is that they would annihilate. The annihilation between electron and anti-electron produces pure energy in, uh, in the shape of photons. Those photons have a specific energy uh, signature that tells us, okay, that was an annihilation of an electron and anti-electron. So we have two photons with this and this energy. So antiparticle, particle, meet, annihilate, disappear. The problem is that at the very beginning of the universe, and if I can find my mouse again, the very beginning of the universe, so at the very beginning of um, the Big Bang, the theory suggests that we should have had equal amounts of matter and antimatter produced. Okay, so 50% of the universe was matter, 50% of the universe was antimatter. That would mean, if we put the two and two together, that, okay, we have 50-50, of course, everything is super dense at the beginning, so they meet, they meet, they annihilate, and everything goes to zero. So we only have energy. Well, if that would be true, we wouldn't be sitting here. So we wouldn't be here, the Earth wouldn't exist, the universe wouldn't exist, because everything would have gone in annihilation. So the question is, if that theory of the Big Bang is correct, and so far, as far as we know, it is, what happens to antimatter? Because we can't see those signatures of annihilation anywhere in the universe, at least not to the amount where we could say, aha, uh -huh, the other 50% is there in that galaxy or on that side. We don't see those signatures. So we can, we can see from this question that this is really, really a big, important question that um, is the core of what antimatter factory does. So the antimatter factory that before me and Michael talked about that it's our favorite experiment, uh, they are trying to study why this happened. So why either antimatter disappeared or why did it transform into something else or what is that difference? Because if you don't know what the difference is or how antimatter would react differently with each other than matter would, we can't really answer that question of why we are here. So those are the questions, some of the questions that we are wondering about the beginning of the universe. Hopefully we will be able to find something out. Maybe this year, maybe next, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 50. But the questions don't end here. Oh, they begin here. Um, and they also don't end at today. They actually continue from today onwards. What cosmologists, so astrophysicists, uh, what they see when observing the universe is that the universe seems to be expanding. Actually, we have so-called accelerated expansion. In order for accelerated expansion to appear, there has to be another type of energy in the universe something that is making it expand. And that is 
for what we are considering now, 69% uh, of our universe. And that energy is called the dark energy. Why is it called dark energy? No, Lord Voldemort has nothing to do with it. There's no uh, black magic or anything like that. Dark energy is dark because we cannot see it. We do not know what it is. So definitely quite a lot of questions for your students and yourself to try and explore in the future decades. Um, so it's really up to them what we will discover next. But before that, I would actually like to ask you, what would you like to discover next today? Because this is the part where I want to answer your questions to really see what you're interested in um, and to really see where I absolutely messed up with my explanations because I'm pretty sure that I did. So now I will stop share so I can see you. So just to check, are you only interested in what they're hoping uh, that we'll discover next or that you'll discover next? Or is this any questions they have? Any questions, yeah, see? I told you, I was a bit confusing. Uh, but yeah, any questions that you might have, what would you like to know or learn about CERN, about particle physics, about my dog? <laughs> Whatever question comes to mind. I do not promise that I can answer everything. We all know that there is no person in the world who can answer everything. Uh, I don't try to be an exception to that. But I've, but I've often found with Anya, if it's something that she doesn't know the answer to, she'll know someone who knows the answer to, or she'll know of a, a good way to try and figure out the answer. So ask her, even if you think she personally might not know, she'll be able to lead you in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, and the person who knows people who know some people, yeah. So the first question was from Stratos. Uh, when did CERN start thinking about dark energy and dark matter? Well, to be honest, decades ago. Uh, so as soon as they started talking about dark energy and dark matter, especially dark matter, um, this was something that automatically triggered minds of particle physicists in general, not just CERN, because the thing is, Dark matter are particles that we don't know, which means that we want to know them. Uh, so it's automatic for particle physicists. It's like, I don't know that, I want to know. So yeah. But the thing is, dark energy and dark matter are incredibly difficult to study because, well, what we're seeing is nothing interacts with them. Nothing that we know interacts with them. Light doesn't interact with them. The only thing that interacts, or well, the only way they interact is through, um, so dark matter interacts with gravity. And gravity is something that we don't understand in any way. So yeah, a lot of questions coming that way. And um, that is something that, yeah, I think is going to be worth a couple of Nobel Prizes in the future. Hopefully near future, but uh, we'll see. Uh, then Carlton asked, could there have been an expansion in two directions similar to a dipole where you would have an expansion to the left which contains antimatter? What do you think? So this is already touching a bit upon um, the questions of multiverses so that you would have an anti-universe somewhere else this is something that yeah i i would not know anything about um so yeah it's something that i can't answer i can only answer that in our universe there is no subspace that only has antimatter because we would see signatures of that. But if there is another universe with antimatter, theoretically, maybe. Um, but there's also no reason um, if we look at how production of matter and antimatter from energy, um, so pair production, how it works, 
it wouldn't really make sense for them to go matter in one direction and antimatter in the other direction because it is anisotropic, so it goes in all directions equally. So yeah, something has to have been at play at the very beginning. Maybe it was something that caused antimatter to go to one direction and um, matter to the other. But this is something that it will take us a while to discover So yes. Sorry, I can't give you a more satisfying answer on that one. Okay, then was a question. How do we know that dark matter consists of elementary particles? Whew. Um, that depends on how you define elementary particles, but it has to consist of something. And we're not necessarily saying that dark matter consists of elementary particles, but whatever it consists of, well, end of the day, it has to be some type of particles or is it, or it's just a type of energy. Um, so whatever it is, we have no idea what it is and we do want to know what it is. So, yeah. Is there any particles that haven't been observed yet and how would it change the standard model? Yes, so there is one, so there's several hypothetical particles that haven't been discovered yet. Um, it's very simple. Every theory, like many theories have been developed in particle physics. Every one of them has a different prediction of which particles we could have. Uh, currently, we do not have one single particle like we had before 2012 when we discovered Higgs boson. Um, there are several different options, some of them more likely, less likely. Um, definitely some of these suggestions or hypotheses uh, are ex would be extremely interesting. For example, graviton. So what would be a graviton? If we look at, for example, electromagnetic force or electromagnetic interaction, electromagnetic interaction happens by particle exchanging um, photons. So photons are the carriers of this interaction. Gravity could also have a particle like that, theoretically. Um, but there was no such particle ever discovered. So that could theoretically be a nice addition to theory. And I do notice that I'm using theoretically and theory in opposite um, ways of saying it. But uh, yeah, so... I think hypothetically would be a better word. So hypothetically, we could find a graviton, uh, we could find anxions, we could um, find supersymmetry particles, but with every year and with every discovery that we make, some of them are getting further and further away, as in they are less and less likely for us to be able to discover them. Ooh, and now there's a question really directed at me. So Stratos, you've been to CERN many times. That's amazing. So have I. Um, so Science Gateway is a new facility at CERN. It's the new science center uh, that tells you the story of how CERN discovers things. So both acceleration and detection. Uh, and it tells you the story through a series of um, interactive exhibits and hands-on experiments and things like that. Uh, we also have a specific exhibition for the Big Bang. So really the development of the Big Bang uh, and one for quantum. And additionally, we have one dedicated to theoretical physics, um, which is done through art. It is specifically that part is a bit more like globe. So the globe of science and innovation before had a nice big exhibition. That exhibition is now gone. The same with Microcosm that was before um, an exhibition. Both of them have been updated and moved to this new facility, Science Gateway. Um, for those of you who might have been to CERN before, um, if you know School Lab, School Lab has also been moved into Science Gateway. Now, it's, now it has a boring name of Educational Labs, uh, but at least it's twice the size, which means it can take 
twice as many visitors. So you are almost twice as likely to get a spot in a workshop if you're coming with students. Um, and the last part of Science Gateway um, is also the Science Gateway Auditorium where we're having um, shows about particle physics. So my part. And, and just to add, anyone who is interested in seeing a behind-the-scenes tour of Science Gateway, that'll be the last session of this course on December 20th with some of Anya's colleagues, Anastasia, Yota, and Guillaume. And one-third of that, roughly, will be a, a tour of, I think, the labs of Science Gateway, so like the, the new version of School Lab that they have there. But they might show some other parts. That session also has, they'll go over their uh, education resource website, which is brand new in the past couple months, and a Solvay educational video video and other content, like video and experiment uh, series. Um, so there'll be a whole session dedicated to some of that stuff on Gateway. Uh, hopefully a lot of you will join to see even more detail than Anya could answer while answering a question. Um, yeah. That's exactly the case. I will answer first Stratos, and I've seen the other question by Carlton as well, but just Stratos because oh, I'm talking before about- Before we answer, should we invite people if they want to ask questions to use their mic too, or do you prefer keeping it in the chat? Um, exactly, you can also raise your hand um, virtually or with your actual hand um, and just, I will call on you. Um, okay, so Stratos is asking if the LHC is off now. So the Large Hadron Collider, um, works eight months a year, more or less, depending on the year. And over winter, it is shut down so that we allow for updates and um, fixing stuff and stuff like that. Uh, so yes, currently LHC is off. Uh, it's going to be turned off until end of February, uh, which means that we do have underground visits, but that does not necessarily make... Um, yeah, it doesn't guarantee that you will be able to go underground because uh, that is still based on how many slots we have and based on, of course, if they're doing any reparations. Uh, so, for example, if they're doing some reparations or updates at CMS, you can't go there because physics still has priority. Well, I'm and on the note of going underground, you're all invited to come underground with Steve Goldfarb on Friday in the vir uh, virtual visit of Atlas. Um, exactly. So, so I, I often joke that with Steve that thank you for having them shut down the LHC so that you can take us underground uh, just for this course. But no, they, they were shutting it down anyways. And uh, just a, a small note on, can you get underground? So I was planning on being at CERN this week and I was asking Steve, can, can I go with you? And can you take me underground to do this? And it came up that apparently to join a virtual visit, you need to be qualified as a guide. So he asked yeah. if I had done the guide training and he just to say, Steve, remember, I don't actually work there. Like I'm not allowed to do the guide training, <laughs> but if you'll let me do the training, then sure. But so it, it works out almost better that I'm not there. So then he can take, a, he can take us underground and you're not held back by me not let, being allowed to go underground. So it, it can be complicated when you try and go underground, but yes, they did shut the beam line down just in time for particle physics for teachers. Yeah, it was absolutely perfect timing. Well, to be honest, if you're VIP enough, they also um, shut it down for you uh, during the year. For example, if you're President Macron, then they turn off LHC just for you. I, I, I will not, not comment on whether or not, yet, but yeah. <laughs> give, give it a couple Just, more years. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so Carlton is asking, can particle physicists reassemble particles back together to create the original particle? In other words, can they create an electron from its fundamental parts? These are two questions. And I will first answer the first one. <laughs> So can particle physicists reassemble particles back together to create the original particle? <sighs> yes and no, depending on how you're looking at that. So when you're looking at particle detection, what happens is you have one particle, you have one proton and another proton, and they hit together 
And when they collide, what happens is the most famous equation in physics in action. So the most famous one, E equals mc squared. So all of the mass and all of the energy of the particle turns into pure energy. So for a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, what we would what we could imagine having would be pure energy, just energy. Out of that energy, we get new particles. For example, the Higgs boson. So collision, we have particle, particle, energy, and a new particle. These particles, especially if they're large, tend to transform into new particles very quickly. So for example, when we say that we have discovered the Higgs boson, that does not mean that we have directly detected it. However, we know in which ways the Higgs boson could transform or probably more familiar word would be decay. So the Higgs boson would decay into a bunch of other particles. And the way that it decays, that is its specific signature. Okay? So it decays into particles that are going through the detector and those particles are then detected. We don't recreate those particles back together to see the Higgs boson, but what we do is we put together the information about those particles. And just like when we have an explosion in mechanics or when we would have a collision in mechanics, based on those traces, if we trace everything back, just like Sherlock Holmes or Charlotte Holmes before, we are able to de 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 uh, deduce what was the particle that decayed into the particles that we um, now saw. And now I come to the second question. So can they create an electron from its fundamental parts? So this is this question is absolutely fantastic because we very often get it from students as well. And it shows just why I personally hate the word particle decay when it comes to this. When you're talking about particle decay, very often we would think of, okay, uh, let's say a Higgs boson fell apart into its constituents, into fundamental parts of Higgs boson. That is not the case because the Higgs boson was not made out of photons. It was not made out of muons. When it ended its life, new particles appeared instead of Higgs boson. So they were not inside Higgs boson. And same would go. Um, if we would have electron decay, of course, typically we would say, let's say muon decay. So muon is a heavier brother of an electron. And when it decays, we get out an electron and we get two neutrinos. But that does not mean that that electron and the two neutrinos were the fundamental parts of a muon. The particles that I showed in that circle before, so the particles that create the um, model, uh, the standard model or the particle zoo, those are elementary particles. And as far as we know, they are not made of fundamental parts. They are the fundamental parts. So that would mean that we cannot recreate those particles just by putting everything else, like everything that decayed into back together. Because if we would put all of that back together, we could get something completely different as well. Uh, so, yeah, I hope that was a good enough answer. But it is a very, very complex and abstract thing to think about. Okay, so Gordon is uh, saying that students like stories about the history of science oh there's so many good stories in history of science um but to be completely honest 
well, I love stories about the history of science as well, just like I see everyone else um, loving them too. Um, I also love stories about the present of science um, because if we're talking about history of science, we are very often talking about um, a world of science that does not exist anymore. So the processes that were used in the past are diff are somewhat different from what we're using um, now. So the science, the way that we do science is slightly different now than it was in the past. And I think it's important for students not only to learn from history, but also learn from the stories that we have now. So from the stories of still living scientists, the stories of, I don't know, how... LHC, when it first started, there was an accident and yeah, they had to stop it for two years to repair the damage done by um, a fault in electrical connections. So those things are also, I can say, equally as interesting um, because kids can actually, for those things, they can go on Google and they can find actual photos and they can find people who actually went there and saw that and they can really discuss, OK, what happened? How how did they solve that? Oh, my God, can I meet the scientists that actually solved that problem and things like that? So um, I think that history of science should be um, taught in an equal level with presence of the present of science. Because science is a present, of course. And 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 with that story, that that reminded me of one of the things I like, which is the human aspect of it as well. So, this would be a good question to ask Steve about on Friday. But he told me a story about that same leak. That's the when they lit up the the LHC, and then there was a a, a like that one from like a decade and a half ago, not from a couple months ago, right? Or is that the yeah, one yeah. a couple months ago? Okay, so they were they were filming things there like it was a big event and he was in the atlas control room and they realized there was a problem but they were also filming the the celebration of having the beam beam line up so part of it they they said to themselves okay for the purpose of the news report now we're going to ignore that we know there's a big problem because hopefully someone will fix it before it gets worse and so there's this weird couple of hours where they were just pretending things were okay because that's how it was supposed to be. Meanwhile, in the background, everyone was trying to sort it out. So there, like, there's interesting things about like the nights when things like that happened and what everyone was doing running around behind the scenes. And I mean, the story of that is very similar to the story that happened this year. So this year in summer, um, end of August, we again had a leak, not as catastrophic as it was in 2008. Uh, but there was a leak that, of course, endangered um, the LHC itself. So what we could see as everyday um, people not working on an accelerator or anything, coming to, I don't know, the restaurant where we have those big screens telling us what's happening with the uh, beam, we could just see, OK, the beam is down because of some technical um, fault. That's a common occurrence. And then the beam was down the next day as well. And the next day. So slowly they were starting like, you would know a person who knew a person who knew that other person whose boss is that boss's friend or something like that. And we would start getting the news of, oh, okay. It was a leak over there. Oh, he has some photos. Give me those photos. So it's it really, in the end, it's like, in high school, when you figure out that um, that uh, cute schoolmate of yours is now dating that girl from, uh, I don't know, 4B or something. So it was really people exchanging photos, exchanging information, being like, oh, my boss said it's going to be fixed in a week. Oh, no, my boss said that this could be the end of the run. So, um, yeah, it's it's really, really fun. And there was silence. Well, that, that that might be a good point to wrap things up at then, because it's uh, it's been a long time. We've taken a lot of your time, but it's been uh, absolutely fantastic uh, to have you 
oh, we're wondering how the weather is in Geneva. I can tell you it's cold in Paris. Uh, yeah, um, in Geneva, it's night. <laughs> um, and it is, uh, of course, cold, completely, like, completely cloudless, which is so weird for Geneva this time of year. Uh, there's no cloud in the sky, but uh, yeah, it is minus too much. So anything that's minus something is already too much. But there is no snow in Geneva. Uh, snow in Geneva is actually relatively rare. Um, but there is snow. We can see quite a lot of snow in the Alps, especially the Mont Blanc. And the Jura Mountain on the other side um, is as well completely white. And, so it and, feels almost like winter. <laughs> and it's a couple hundred degrees warmer than the LHC often is. So yeah. Oh yeah. Just I mean it's a couple hundred relative. degrees. <laughs> it's a couple hundred degrees warmer still than what LHC is now, because even when we have the shutdown, we wouldn't heat it up unless we really need to heat up a specific part, because uh, heating it up and cooling it down, it takes forever. And that's why, for example. Um, they were already talking about, yeah, when there was that leak, it could happen that they would have to heat a whole part of LAC up, um, and that would take forever. So, yeah. Luckily, the cool people of um, our technical teams were able to fix it on time. And so I was, uh, as I was starting to say, uh, that probably uh, brings this session to a close, but it's been a, a great pleasure to have you on, uh, kicking things off with an introduction to, to particle physics and to CERN. So uh, thank you again for, uh, for this introduction, uh, Anya, and thank you to everyone for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you all on Friday for the visit of the Atlas Detector. I have one more thing. I forgot yeah, to, yeah, several of course, more if you want. I forgot to share the links, right? Ah yes. Well, the majority of the yeah, majority of all the things that we have from CERN can be reached through our physics education research website. So that's CERN.ch slash PER. Um, so there you can find um a really big bunch of papers that our team has written over the past on how to connect particle physics to classrooms. Um, you can find various resources. Uh, for different experiments that you can do and things like that. So it is a, quite a rich page if you want to look into it. And, I'll, and also these links and all the links from the chat, I've been copying them and I'll include them somewhere so everyone will have access. Probably I'll just add them to the email with the Zoom link for Steve's session, just to avoid having too many different emails for people to keep track of. Um, but you'll get all those if you didn't keep track of them, because uh, I know it's always hard to keep track of every link, and you might think of it like a couple of days from now, a week from now. So don't worry, we've got you covered that way. Um, and anything else to add? No, that was it from my side. Perfect. Uh, so thank you again, and thank you to everyone else. Pleasure. And have a great evening, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye.